Hello, this is Kevin Thompson, and I'm a, an attorney with uh, Davis McGrath LLC here in Chicago. And I'd like to welcome you all to our Davis McGrath IP webinar series. Our today's webinar for September 7, 2011, is called "Why You Should Register Your Trademarks in Other Countries." And uh, today we'll be uh, going for about 30 minutes. And uh, uh, certainly, all throughout, if you have questions, uh, please uh, raise your hand through the webinar and uh, we'll be able to get to your questions. Uh, we'll certainly also have time at the end for questions as well. Um, our currently scheduled next webinar is October 5th. Uh, I believe that our next topic is Copyright Basics, uh, so I'm looking forward to doing that as well. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Trademark basics. Um, I'm going to presume that people are generally familiar with the United States system for purposes of this presentation, but just in basics, uh, trademarks are symbols that are used in commerce to identify the source of particular goods or services. And these can be words or designs or words with designs. And uh, these particular uh, symbols uh, can have great economic value. Uh, and what separates trademarks from other forms of intellectual property is that trademarks, as long as you're using them and still using them in commerce for the services, uh, they can last in perpetuity as opposed to uh, copyrights and uh, patents which do expire. For purposes of today's discussion, uh, I'm going to present you with a hypothetical. And this involves a manufacturer with the United States registrations for a design mark and a word mark. And these particular products are sold worldwide, but primarily throughout the US, Canada, and Europe. But of concern is that this product is manufactured in China. And so the question is, uh, what types of protection would be available? Trademark rights, once you keep in mind, are territorial. Just because you've got a United States registration doesn't mean you're protected throughout the world. Every country has its own regulations. I uh, should also mention that it's important to search your mark before proceeding. Uh, meanings for marks can vary from country to country. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the Chevrolet uh, Nova uh, they, they learned pretty quickly on that uh, the word translated from Nova translated into Spanish as no go. So uh, it, it's important to <laughs> keep that in mind uh, when you're considering a, a mark that might be used in other countries. But every country has its own regulations, so uh, it's important to keep in mind uh, when you're trying to pr uh, protect your mark somewhere. Uh, to keep in mind what options are available. Why should you register your mark in a foreign country? And there's essentially two reasons. One is for offensive purposes, and the second is for defensive purposes. Um, for offensive purposes, uh, you might want to oppose somebody else's mark or seek to cancel somebody else's registration. But the primary purpose would be defensive, I believe, and that would be to block others from registering marks that are similar to your own. And it also allows you to maintain control over your brand. Uh, there are plenty of stories of nefarious distributors who have registered clients' marks in foreign countries and therefore made it almost impossible for a client to switch distributors at a certain point uh, because you know, it was the distributor that owned, owned the intellectual property, not the manufacturer. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that if you register your trademark in a particular country, you also may be able to register that mark with their particular customs. And so, for example, in the United States, you can register your, your mark with, uh, with U.S. Customs, and they will help uh, pr go through shipments that are coming into the United States uh, for, for trademark protection and uh, might uh, sh alert you to a shipment of uh, uh, you know, infringing goods. So how are rights obtained? And essentially there are two major ways this is done across the world. One is simply by registration and the second is by use. In the United States, uh, we, we do have use-based uh, 
rights. But here's an example of a registration certificate. I just threw that up there as an example of what a registration certificate looks like. Um, but many countries are what's known as first-to-file jurisdictions um, in that the first person to register their mark with the particular authority owns the rights. And so it's, it's really hard for a latecomer to object if someone has already registered your mark there and um, does not uh, you know, want you to, uh, to have protection for your own mark. If, if they're blocking you and you're the latecomer, uh, you'll need to want to check with counsel to see what your options are. Uh, and the second way, as we said before, is by use. In the United States, uh, you have what are called common law rights by using your mark in commerce. And federal registration gives you additional benefits, such as rights across the United States. Um, but uh, if, if you're the, the prior user and you come across a registration uh, that you, you're, you're the prior user for, you might be able to cancel it depending on uh, the facts. Another thing I should talk about briefly is uh, what's called Paris Convention. And it's a way of getting priority in a foreign country based on your, your U.S. filing. Let's say you, you file a mark here in the United States and um, you want to protect that mark in other countries as well. You don't have to hurry out and, and register the mark in, in all these other jurisdictions right away. Instead, what you can do is wait until the end of, of the, the Paris Convention period, which is six months from the U.S. filing date. And then, as long as you claim this Paris Convention priority in your application in the foreign jurisdiction, um, you have the same effective filing date as when you filed here in the United States. And um, it is uh, quite effective if you are able to do so. Uh, when you are trying to register your mark in a foreign country, you essentially have three major options. One is direct filing. The second would be a regional registration, such as uh, the community trademark system that's effect across the European Union. And then the third is called the Madrid system. And I'll talk about each of those in turn. Uh, direct filing is hiring counsel in uh, one particular jurisdiction, say you want to register your mark in Japan. And so you would hire Japanese counsel to register your mark there. Um, it's, uh, it's effective and it works, um, but it gets kind of sort of difficult if, if you are trying to uh, register your mark in, in multiple jurisdictions, you know, to keep track of, of that. And that's something that, uh, you know, counsel can do for you. Second option is regional registration. And there is a uh, system that covers the European Union. Uh, here's a map of that. Uh, the European Union in this part is yellow. Um, and as we'll discuss later, there are certain countries in Europe uh, that are not members of the European Union. So if you want protection in those countries, uh, you would you know, be forced to, to file directly. Um, it's not the only... Uh, regional system out there, uh, but it's certainly the one that most people know about. Uh, the advantages of, of the, this particular system uh, we'll talk about later when we, we talk a specific ex, uh, talk about our hypothetical. Uh, the Madrid system is a system that uh, the U.S. recently became part of within the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, it, it allows you to create what's called an international registration. Uh, it's based on your home registration in the United States, and then you, you create what's called the international registration, which you then extend to a member country that you're interested in. Uh, there are currently 84 countries that are members of what's called the Madrid Protocol. Um, there is also a, a separate system called the Madrid Agreement, uh, but the U.S. is not a member of that. Uh, that, that covers 56 countries. Uh, but uh, the U.S. has said it's not part of that. But many of the, the agreement members are also protocol members. Um, and uh, so uh, if you're interested, in, uh, you can figure out pretty quickly whether or not th those particular 80, one of those 84 countries are, are of benefit to you. Um, the, one of the major advantages of the Madrid system comes from renewals. Uh, there's no need to hire multiple counsel to renew in each country. 
uh, it can make it much easier to administer your portfolio uh, when you are dealing with, with many jurisdictions. Um, we're currently planning a, a webinar just on the Madrid Protocol and its options. There's so many things to talk about. It, we're only going to try to talk about everything here in 30 minutes, where I could probably spend a couple hours just talking about the Madrid system and its intricacies. So uh, without further ado, if there's no immediate questions, I think we're going to pass on to talking about our hypothetical and try to talk a little bit about uh, its um, its application here. Uh, as we said before, it's a what we're going to be talking about is a manufacturer with U.S. registrations for a design mark and a word mark that's sold worldwide, but primarily across the U.S., Canada, and Europe. And this particular product is manufactured in China. So we'll talk about some of each of those jurisdictions in particular. Uh, Canada uh, is uh, our neighbor to the north, and there's a 12 to 24 month application process there. Uh, like the U.S., uh, use is required before an application can register and uh, a registration there is for 15 years from the registration date and um, it, it's a fairly straightforward process to do uh, one of the nice things about uh, dealing with Canada is uh, that their online system through the uh, their US well, so similar to our USPTO online database, they've got an online database that's easily searchable and uh, it's very easy to stay on top of the status of a particular mark there, which is good. Um, and uh, it gives you protection across Canada. And so there are multiple regions, as you'll see here from this map, from Quebec to Ontario, all the way out to the Yukon Territory. So a Canadian registration covers you all across Canada. Uh, the European Union, as we talked about before, uh, this one is our first uh, application of what's called a first-to-file jurisdiction. Uh, in the European Union, uh, the first person to register the mark is the uh, person to have uh, control over it. Um, there are, is an opposition process uh, you know, throughout the application procedure, but uh, once uh, the registration is granted, uh, you know, there are limited ways to, uh, to cancel. Um, there is a um, 20, normally takes about 26 weeks to get a registration, assuming that the, uh, the application is not opposed. Um, this one is particularly interesting because use is not required for registration, but uh, you, your marks could be canceled for non-use after approximately three years. So if you haven't used uh, your, your mark there, um, uh, some interested third party might be able to file a cancellation petition. Um, but it is, uh, you know, something that they would have to bring. It's not automatically canceled if you're not using it. And uh, I should mention that the, the term for a European Union registration is 10 years from the application date. Uh, another interesting thing about uh, the CTM is, uh, let's say you file your application and it's rejected and you still want protection in some of these member countries, you can convert your application uh, from the European Union itself, you can pick specific member countries that you are particularly interested in. Um, there are um, ways uh, to do that. It becomes a little more expensive than, than if you'd filed directly, uh, like say for example the United Kingdom or Germany, uh, but it still gives you uh, the benefit of, of having at least filed your application and uh, you're able to, to salvage essentially the filing date, which is a, it's a good thing. But one thing to keep in mind though about the, the CTM, as we mentioned before, is it doesn't cover all of, the, uh, all of the countries in Europe. For example, it doesn't cover Norway, uh, Iceland, Russia, or Switzerland. And uh, Turkey, I should mention as well, is a, a CTM member candidate. So I put up a chart here of all of the European countries or at least areas like Russia, which cover Europe slightly, uh, they are uh, not member countries. And so if you want protection in one of these countries, uh, your best bet uh, would be to uh, file directly. 
Uh, the biggest one that usually comes up is Norway and Switzerland. Uh, somebody wants protection across the European Union. Uh, those are certainly two large um, areas of commerce that uh, you would want to be covered. Um, an interesting side note, I should also mention that uh, the Vatican is uh, considered a separate country and uh, even though you may have an Italian registration or a European Union registration, it doesn't cover the Vatican. So if there's a particular reason that you would want trademark protection in the Vatican, uh, you would need to file directly there. Um, another interesting thing to talk about is uh, there are other uh, regional registrations. This one is called the Benelux Union. It covers Belgium, Netherlands, and the Luxembourg. And a registration in Benelux uh, gives you protection in all three countries. Our next major area we were in our hypothetical was China, which is where the goods are manufactured. Uh, normally, it takes about 15 months uh, for the application to proceed through. Um, the filing in China can be done either directly or through the Madrid Protocol. Um, but in my experience, uh, the Madrid Protocol is probably not the best for, for China. Um, let's say, for example, you file in uh, China through the Madrid Protocol and there's some sort of office action, you're essentially forced to fire, hire local counsel in order to respond to the office action. And um, uh, in my experience, uh, the Chinese government is, is particularly good at throwing out uh, objections for multitude of reasons. And so you're probably better off just filing directly because you're going to need to hire local counsel anyways. Um, Use is not required there, uh, similar to what we talked about for the European Union, uh, but again, three years of non-use can result in cancellation. And uh, China uh, is a 10-year uh, registration period, which is calculated from the registration date. Um, another interesting note for China is that their word marks, although they do protect word marks and design marks, their word mark protection is not as broad as the protection you would get in the United States. Um, in my experience, uh, if, if a mark is, is registered as a word mark and you have a particular stylization of that, uh, it may or may not be protected if, if somebody's infringing the design component of that. Uh, so uh, your, your best bet would be to um, uh, you know, have a design registration as well. Um, another interesting issue for China is the fact that uh, since um, their native language uh, allows for transliterations of marks, uh, you know, there's multiple ways uh, in different dialects to say uh, a particular phrase or word. Uh, you certainly want to talk with counsel about uh, the transliterations of your mark and you figure out a way that native speakers might say your mark and register in that way. And you could also, uh, if you really want to be defensive, register it in multiple ways. But keep in mind that registrations can be expensive. So I uh, sort of want to uh, keep that in mind uh, before you go on a massive uh, campaign there. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that China doesn't cover everything that's that's covered by by the Chinese government for example Hong Kong is still a separate uh, registration area uh, Chinese registration only covers mainland China so if you want protection in Hong Kong which uh, many of you remember used to be a British protectorate is now uh, part of China but if you still want protection in Hong Kong you need uh, to obtain a separate registration and again registrations there are 10 years uh, but this time this calculated from the application date as opposed to the registration date there. So, um, so there are certain common strategies uh, for protecting your marks in foreign countries and uh, we'll talk about each of those briefly here. Um, the first is uh, where the goods are manufactured. In this case, uh, in my hypothetical, it's China. And so it certainly would be prudent to register your mark where the mark where the goods are manufactured uh, because 
that often is the source of uh, counterfeits or uh, what sometimes uh, are essentially goods that are manufactured off the same assembly line. A uh, common story that comes out of China is uh, the, 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 the big cost for a, for a producer is to set it up, to run, to make the production line. And so, you know, they'll produce maybe the, the official order of, of 30,000 goods, uh, but then uh, they do another 10,000 on the side and uh, label it differently. And, you know, the goods came off the same assembly line as, as the official goods, uh, but they're being sold on the black market or or so forth. And so uh, trademark protection in those particular countries uh, may, may help you uh, to stop the, those types of, of infringements. Um, it's also uh, a good idea, especially uh, for, for customs purposes as well. Uh, another air common strategy is to focus on the biggest markets first. And it, it's a good idea to talk to uh, the stakeholders in your company to figure out uh, just which are truly the biggest markets and which are important um, uh, for registration purposes. Uh, just because something uh, may not be a big seller right now, you may not, may not think that particular jurisdiction is, is so big, just looking at one report, but if you talk to the people on the ground and you realize that, you know, your salespeople have a big, you know, push coming up in a particular country, uh, it might be a good idea to uh, have a look and see what, what your, your portfolio protection is in, in those particular countries. Um, the third major thing is to uh, keep in mind is you might want to file defensively. Uh, <laughs> and uh, w one thing you might do is look around and uh, figure out which ones of the countries that you might be expanding into and look to see which ones of those are uh, the first to file jurisdictions, you know, where, you know, the first person to register the mark has protection. And so uh, it would be a good idea to uh, look at those and, and see if, for example, um, you know, you, you really want to, you know, be protected uh, in the European Union, which is a first to file jurisdiction, uh, then you certainly would want to, uh, you know, consider registering your mark there. So I think we're at the point where now we can probably turn things over to questions if uh, people have any. Uh, I think there, what you do is um, uh, there's a, a question box there. So if anybody has any questions, now would be a good time. Or if you have particularly have uh, a uh, you know burning question that I'm not covering here. Well, uh, so far it doesn't look anybody has had any questions, so this hopefully that means I've been thorough. Um, the, uh, as I said before, our next webinar is going to be coming up on October 5th. We'll be talking about copyright basics, and um, I, I hope that uh, you folks can join us for that. Thank you so much.